genelde genel svakaya çakşu un milicam yina tasmai shri gurveni maha ma um vishnu padaya krishna prastaya butale shri ma divakti vedanta swami dinamne namaste saraswati devi Garvani Pachari ne never says a sunyavari Bastiat Yare Satari ne Anchakalpa Taru Bishakri Pasindu Pay Vajapatitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadanhar Shri Vasudeva Gaur Bhaktivinoda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 I turn to the second canto, first chapter, verse number three. Didra Jriate Natam Vyavayena Chayavaya Divya Karta Thai Rajan Kutumba Balane Nava The lifetime of such an envious householder is passed at night either in sleeping or in sex indulgence, in the daytime either making money or maintaining family members per court. The present human civilization is based on the principles of sleeping and sense indulgence at night and earning money in the day. It's funny to spending the same money for family maintenance, such a form of human society is condemned by the Bhagavad school. Because human life is a combination of matter and spirit, the whole process of that knowledge is directed at liberating the spirit from the contamination of matter. The knowledge concerning this is called Atmatattva. Those men who are too materialistic are unaware of this knowledge and are more inclined to economic development for material enjoyment. Such materialistic men are called karmis or true flavors. And they allow regular economic development or association with women for sex and dolls. Since those who are above the karmis, that is the gyanis, yogis, and devotees, are strictly prohibited from sex indulgence. The karmis are more or less devoid of a lot of tough knowledge, and as such, their life is spent without spiritual profit. 
Human life is not meant for hard labor for economic development, nor is it meant for sex indulgence like that of dogs and hogs. It is specifically meant for making a solution to the problems of material life and from the miseries thereof. So the karmis waste their valuable human life by sleeping in sex indulgence at night, and by laboring hard in the midday time to accumulate wealth. And after doing so, they try to improve the standard of materialistic life. The materialistic way of life is described here in this nutshell, nutshell and how foolish men waste the boon of human life is described as follows. Next verse. <laughs> Deha patya kaladra deshu atma saneshu satyapi sasham pramatta nidanam pasyanapi na pasyati. Persons devoid of atma tatma. Hmm. Do not inquire into the problems of life being too attached to the fallible soldiers like body, children, and wife. Although sufficiently experiences, they still do not see their inevitable destruction. The material world is called the world of death. Every living being from Brahma, whose duration of life is some thousands of millions of years, down to the germs who live for only a few seconds, only struggling for existence. Therefore, this life is a sort of a fight with material nature, which imposes death upon all. In the human form of life, a living being is competent enough to understand of this great struggle, but being too attached to family members, society and country, he wants to win over the invincible material nature by the aid of bodily strength, children, wife, relatives, etc. Although he is sufficiently experienced in the matter by dint of past experience and previous examples of his deceased predecessors, he does not see that the so-called fighting soldiers like children, relatives, society members, and countrymen are all fallible in the great struggle. One should examine the fact that his father or his father's father has already died and he himself is therefore also sure to die. And similarly, his children would also be would-be fathers of their children and would also die in due course. No one will survive in this struggle with material nature. The history of human society definitely proves it, yet the foolish people still suggest that in the future they will be able to live perpetually with the help of material science. This poor fund of knowledge exhibited by human society is certainly misleading. It's all due to ignoring the constitution of the living soul. This material world exists only as a dream due to our attachment to it. Otherwise, the living soul is always different from the material nature. The great ocean of material nature is tossing with the waves of time and so-called living conditions are sometimes like foaming bubbles, which appear before us as bodily self, wife, children, society, countrymen, etc., etc. Due to a lack of knowledge, we become victimized by the force of ignorance and thus spoil the valuable energy of human life in a vain search for a permanent living condition, which are impossible in this material world. <clears throat> Our friends, relatives, and so-called Wives and children are not only fallible, fallible, but also bewildered by the outward glamour of material existence. As such, they cannot save us. Still, we think that we are safe within the orbit of families and country. The whole materialistic advancement of human civilization is like decoration of a dead body. Everyone is a dead body flapping only for a few days, and yet all the energy of human life is being wasted in the decoration of this dead body. Sukadeva Goswami is pointing out that the duty of the human being after showing the actual position of bewildered human activities. Persons who are devoid of atma or knowledge, atma tattva, are misguided, but those who are devoted to the Lord have perfect realization of transcendental knowledge and are not bewildered. Hmm. 
So the materialistic way of life is an um, anomaly, as nicely described here. It says that the living entity is not meant to take birth in the material world, but somehow it happens. <laughs> And the amount of living entities who accept material bodies in the material world are the minority of all living entities. And the majority of the living entities in existence do not come to the material world. They remain with Krishna in the spiritual world. They are called Nitya Siddhas, are eternally perfect and never touch the material world. It's only a few unfortunate living entities for whatever reason have come to this material world in order to somehow or other ex exhibit their energy by trying to create something which is not creatable. That is lasting happiness. Why does the living entity accept such a illusionary position? Because there is a certain consciousness that, that brings about this particular situation. And that is seeing oneself as being the center. Seeing oneself as being the center means to uh, try to use everything in relationship to oneself for one's own progress and happiness. And therefore that consciousness propels one into the material energy where one is like everyone else, all thinking they want to be the center. So there's a hard struggle and competition amongst the living entities in the material world to somehow or other be the center of existence. And that hard struggle takes the form of uh, accumulating friends, relatives, and uh, facilities in order to somehow or other find happiness. The sad part about it, people think it's normal. Mm -hmm. To live in the material world is accepted as something normal. When we grow up, we're taught that this material world is meant for our enjoyment. And we are given a certain set of goals in life in order to achieve that lasting enjoyment. And that is to somehow or other position yourself in the material world where you can facilitate whatever desires you need by through the work you have performed. And therefore, there's a great competition in order to get that situation of continual happiness. Happiness in the material world is described in the Bhagavad Gita I Krishna yehi sam sparsa ja boga, dukkha yona ya evate, avanta vanta kunta ya nateshu ramate buddha. Uh, go to Bhagavad Gita chapter 5, verse number 22. <laughs> this describes material happiness. Mm -hmm. 522. Intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery, which are due to contact with material senses. Such pleasures have a beginning and an end, and the wise man does not delight in them. Material sense pleasures are due to contact with the senses, which are all temporary because the body itself is temporary. A liberated soul is not interested in anything which is temporary, knowing well the joys of transcendental pleasure. So this particular point is the main point is that pleasure comes with contact with the objects and the senses. It says that the, uh, the sense objects, and then the senses are higher than the sense objects, the mind is higher than the senses, the intelligence is higher than the mind, and the soul is highest of all. 
So we can exist on either one of two platforms, <clears throat> either on the platform of the mind and the senses and the objects which come by way of the objects in the material existence or on the platform of intelligence in the soul, which means to engage in activities which have no material results. And that is spiritual activities. So one who is intelligent will not try to enjoy anything temporary because they know it has a beginning and an end and therefore one has to continue to somehow or other try to struggle to bring about temporary facilities for sense gratification. <clears throat> sense gratification doesn't satisfy the soul because it's external. It has to do with the body, <clears throat> the mind, the senses, and the objects of the senses. <clears throat> And so the actual position of happiness is within the soul itself, as the soul is known as Satchit Ananda. Ananda means etern in unlimitedly happy. A happiness is not a relief from suffering. If you ha if you have a if you're sick, a doctor, and the doctor somehow helps you to overcome your sickness you might feel happy. Well, what kind of happiness is that? It's simply a relief from suffering. It's not real happiness. <clears throat> if you're hungry, you want to eat. And so you eat and you relieve the pain of hunger. So you consider that some kind of happiness, but actually what it is, a relieving of a hunger. So if you analyze, you'll find that every material forms of happiness is simply the counteracting of the suffering. Counteracting of the suffering, according to scripture, is not happiness. Real happiness is independent of everything else, and it comes by its own accord. And that is the nature of the living and being's existence. It exists naturally. What is that happiness? The happiness of experiencing the relationship with ourselves through the super self or Krishna himself. In other words, we are not happy because we are not with Krishna. <laughs> That's basically the problem. <laughs> All other forms of unhappiness are extensions of that one principle of unhappiness. Because we're not Krishna consciousness, we undergo so many forms of unhappiness, accepting temporary forms of happiness, which are not happiness as ways to find happiness which only, which only frustrates our, our attempt to become happy. As Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati used to say, there's only one problem in the material world, lack of Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> That's all. <clears throat> when one is not Krishna conscious, then there is simply an extension of that one problem in the form of any uh, other so-called defined problems which come in relationship to not having that one happiness, which is being in connection with Krishna. Can we be out of connection with Krishna? No. The soul is eternal and the soul is never disconnected from its source. But like when you go to dream, sleep at night, you dream of something that is different from your actual waking existence. And in that dream, you identify with some kind of happiness or suffering. And you're, you're experiencing something that is completely different than your actual existence, which is your day-to-day -day life. So in that dream state, you take on a whole different set of activities and experiences and you identify with that. When you wake up from the dream, there's a sense of happiness getting back to what is normal. Using that as an analogy, our sense of existence never really ex ceases to exist. A spiritual existence does not cease to exist. It's simply covered. Just like in the dream state, it covers our waking state. 
although our waking state remains our existence, our dream state, some are substitutes for that, and then we start to think in a different way. <clears throat> so material life is like that. We're dreaming. <clears throat> We're dreaming I'm a man. We're dreaming I'm a woman. We're dreaming I'm a member of this particular country. I'm in this particular society, this particular community, this particular family, this particular age group. It's all part of the dream of, of material life. Material life is as simply a dream because the living entity, the soul, has nothing to do with the existence all around us. What happens to the material body does not happen to the soul, which is the living entity. Our birth is simply an acceptance of a particular type of body. Our life in this world is an extension of that acceptance in the form of the activities we perform. And our death is simply ridding ourselves of that same covering that we accepted at the time of birth, which is now transformed into a different form, or it actually has become changed. <clears throat> But we remain the same, that's the whole thing. <laughs> so in remaining the same, we have to understand that we also have uh, a family, we also have friends, we also have community, we also have identity, we also have a gender also, and that's, but that is all on the spiritual platform. So it is said that the material world is simply a, a perverted reflection of the reality. As you look into the mirror, you see the same thing that is on the, that is being reflected into the mirror. But with the image in the mirror, is not real, although it looks just like the image outside. So in the same way, our existence in the spiritual world is also full of variety. There are family members, there are friends, there are even gender, genders, apparent genders and activities, but it is all free from the inebriety of struggle and free from the temporarily, temporal talent, the temporary nature of the material world. It's eternal. So we cannot be happy with something that is contrary to our nature. We may try, but all we do is ultimately struggle. As this verse says, yeah, uh, it's simply a struggle to acquire something that is not able to be acquired, that is happiness. Something that we want to keep, which is longevity, is not within the realm of existence to bring in that. Sometimes we use a little bit of a A, um, a kind of a, like a little antidote. A man, he's, um, he's looking on the ground and he's looking and he's looking and he's looking. Uh, his friend comes along and sees his friend looking around. So he asks him, what do you, uh, did you lose something? He said, yes, I did. He said, I lost some my money. He said, oh, well, I'll help you look for it. So they're both looking. And so uh, finally the friend says to him, are you sure you lost the money here? He says, no, I lost it. And he points down in a different direction. But he says, there's more light here. Mm -hmm. There's more light here. So apparently we think because we can see the objects of sense gratification and we can see the world around us we superimpose this idea that this will bring happiness. And then we go for it. And what is that going for it is there is some temporary relief from suffering or maybe even continual suffering. And then after some time, again, we struggle in the same way. 
And that is the material world. So why is this material world like? Why are we here? And why is it like what it is? Well, we don't belong here. We somehow come, came here because we wanted to be the center of existence, which is not possible. In the spiritual world, there's only one center, and that is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the purpose of life is to finish our business in this material world by freeing ourselves from the desire to enjoy in this material world and engage in devotional service. Once we take up devotional service, that remains the eternal occupation. And then as that progresses and develops, one becomes and one becomes situated above the material energy, although one may still be within the realm of material existence. In the physical sense, one's consciousness is no longer material as it is engaging in spiritual activities. So that's intelligence. So um, therefore one, it says here, one who is actually intelligent does not take part in material sense gratification. Uh, but the living entity is pulled in that direction due to its conditioned nature. If you are conditioned to do something, to break the condition means to take up an activity that is contrary to that same conditioning. And therefore, instead of engaging for the benefit of the mind and senses, we engage for the happiness and benefit of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And by doing that, we transcend, or we, we, we convert the material energy into the spiritual energy, and we rise above the, the dualities of material energy, which are happiness, distress, or a combination of both. Mm -hmm. we, we get situated in what is called Brahma Sokyam, or pure happiness. And that is available because it is our nature to be happy, is the nature of the soul. To be full of knowledge is the nature of the soul. To live forever is the nature of the soul. But none of these things are possible in the material existence. So material existence is a punishment. Such thing as happy life. Happy life exists outside of the material energy. So we are prisoners in this material tabernacle, shackled by our mind and senses and and, uh, and everything else we build the mind and senses. So we are like a living being in a jail that's surrounded by our own man-made bars. Mm -hmm. Our own man, in other words, we increase the the facility of our jail cell by adding more and more things into our life in order to somehow or other uh, counteract the suffering in material existence, which is not possible. Mm -hmm. So it's an unfortunate situation to be in the material world, but here we are. Prabhupada says to have a material body is a bad bargain. It's like you go to the store, you buy an item, you bring it home and you realize it's not what you needed, it's not what you wanted. But on the package it says, uh, no return allowed. So you can't bring it back, you're stuck with it. So in the same way, we are stuck with this material body, but then Prabhupada goes on to explain that devotional service is the best use of a bad bargain. Using, the, using activities for Krishna helps us to rise above the difficulties of material energy and come to our natural position of susukam kartamavyayam, eternal happiness in relationship to the Supreme Lord, because the basis of happiness is relationship. Happiness cannot be found. There is a class of spiritualists who try to be happy without any connection with the Supreme. They think, they, un they understand that the soul 
is spiritual, it's eternal, and they try to find satisfaction simply in uh, detaching themselves from everything material. They achieve some temporary happiness. This is called a happiness of liberation, which comes through various types of processes of elevation of the consciousness away from the material into the spiritual. Basically, these processes are yagyas, omas, various rituals, chanting mantras, and uh, discriminating between what is temporary and what is material and focusing on the temp the uh, uh, between what is material and what is spiritual, it's focusing on the spiritual. But uh, Aruna Krishna, Padam Padam Padantiyada, they fall down again. Na Usmaga Na Samsayaha. They come back again to the material world to again take up materialistic activities. Why? Because there's no relationship with the Supreme. Although they may climb high on the spiritual platform, again, padantiyada, they fall down. Because unless one engages in devotional service, one cannot stay on any spiritual platform of attainment through the processes, through these other processes of spiritual development, which are made, meant for elevation and not meant for uh, achieving the ultimate. The goal is, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, is uh, to engage in devotional ser service. Uh, what is that verse? Uh, to engage in devotional service. And that is... Um, I can't remember the verse, it's, is that out of all the forms of yoga, yoginam apisarve samadgatanyanatmanaha stradavam bhajitet yomam teme yukta tamo maktaha. Krishna says that all those who take up yogi, yoga, only the bhakti yogis will achieve uh, success because their, attain, their, their success is not a process of going up and coming back down like that. And what is their success? They are most intimately united with Krishna and yogi and yoga, and that is the highest platform. So we have to serve. We can serve in the material sense, or we have the opportunity to serve in the spiritual sense. It's all based on service. Without service, there's no connection to the Supreme Lord. When we chant Hare Krishna, we're asking for service. When we read the scriptures, we are fortifying our intelligence, clarif clarifying our mind, so we can understand how to engage in devotional service. It's all about service. Here, the word budgete means, it means the root word means, which is when there is need for service. So service is our nature. If we're not serving uh, one way, we'll serve in another way. Even in the material world, we take up varieties of service, country, society, family members, friends. And Prabhupada goes on to explain that even if one doesn't have any of these connections and service, they find a dog or some kind of animal to serve. So everyone must serve. You can't get away from service. Service is our nature. But when we serve in the material sense, we don't find the happiness we're looking for. We can only find that on when we serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead in devotion. So by Pungsyam Pulo Dharmo. Ito bhakti ya hoksaje hoituki, the priyataya yatma supersede the tea. That service to the Supreme Lord is the highest of all. And as uh, 
Yamaraj, one of the Mahajans, he speaks, he says, Etavam eva loke bhsmin pumsa dharma sprita bhakti yogo bhagavati tamna bhi. He explains that out of all the activities in human society, the highest and most desired activity for the living entity is to engage in devotional service to the Lord. And the essence of that devotional service is to glorify the Lord, his name, his fame, form, qualities, pastimes, entourage, everything in relationship to the Lord is absolute and it's also the Lord also. So when we engage in service of these different uh, aspects of the spiritual uh, energy, we elevate our consciousness to the spiritual realm. And that is the perfection. And there's where satisfaction exists. And so that essence comes with hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Srinvata Svakata Krishna Purnya Shravana Kirtanaha Ridyantosto Abhadrani Vidhunoti Surit Satam that uh, one who engages in hearing the glories of the Lord and develops a taste for it, the Lord within the heart, purifies the heart of that uh, act, act, actor and brings him to the transcendental platform. So we have to develop a taste to hear and, hear and chant the glories of the Lord. We may have a taste for doing things, and that is nice, and that is also service. But in order to get that real taste, that lasting taste, we have to know what is Krishna, what is his nature, what makes him happy, how he relates to us, the living entities in the material world, deals with the material energy, how he deals with his intimate associates in loving transcendental service, all the activities centered around the Supreme Personality of Godhead are divyam, completely transcendental, and completely, uh, what we say, susukam, they're full of transcendental happiness. So uh, we see in the material world, people want to hear about, associate with, and, uh, yeah, hear about and associate with important people, or someone they're attracted to. So uh, we, once we develop our attraction from Krishna, then we want to hear more about him. And that's how we develop our attraction by Krishna. Sometimes devotees complain, I'm not happy. The reason why you're not happy is you're not hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Uh, Narada Muni, when he met his disciple Vyasadeva, and the Vyasadeva had just compiled all the Vedas. And he hadn't, but still, Narada could understand he wasn't happy. And he asked him, but he couldn't understand why he wasn't happy. But then Narada gave the answer, because you haven't properly glorified the name, fame, form, pastimes, and activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then he understood the, the formula and began Srimad Bhagavatam. After he completed Ag Bhagavatam, he, under, he became fully satisfied because Bhagavatam is the essence of all spiritual knowledge surrounding the name, fame, form, pastimes, qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that is the process of devotional service, which is readily available by the mercy of the Lord coming through his representative, the bona fide spiritual master. Sometimes people ask for God's mercy. Here is God's mercy. In the material world, people want the mercy of the Lord in the form of being relieved from the suffering of material existence. That is a kind of mercy, but it's not the mercy that satisfies the living entity. The only satisfaction comes with relationships with the, the Lord. And that, he, that begins, expands, develops, and ultimately reaches higher and higher levels of satisfaction through Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam. And you'll find this is the next verse in the series. 
So go to uh, Canto 2 again, chapter 1, verse number 5. And this is the conclusion of these verses that we read today. 215. Tasmad Bharata Sarvat Mam Bhagavam Ishvara Hari Strota Vyakirti Tavyascha Smarta Vyas Chaitata Bayam. O descendant of King Bart, one who desires to be free from all miseries must hear about, glorify, and also remember the personality of Godhead, who is the super soul, the controller, and the savior from all miseries. So here's the conclusion. So now this verse and purport, which I won't read, it brings one to the stage of Krishna consciousness. And that is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord and remember those glories also. And another principle that should be added on in that is to share this activity with others. And that is called that is called welfare work. Um, people want to do good to others. Here's the best way to do good to others is to become Krishna conscious and help others become Krishna conscious also. That's the highest form of welfare work. And then the most needed and the most desirable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Please, uh, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself or you can type in chat window. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you, all Mrs. Um, Guru Maharaj, thank you so much for a lovely class. It's just a simple question. Um, being in the Great Ashram, so uh, you mentioned about where we, we can only be happy if we serve Krishna. So, how do we take that service? Like, uh, we have to serve our family as well, uh, or we can. Uh, we won't be able to live in this society otherwise, isn't it? Yeah, but Krishna says uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, all that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, as so, well as all activities, austerities you perform should be done to me. So just do everything as a service for Krishna. Mm. Grihasta ashram, ashram means place of spiritual cultivation. So the grihasta or married is an ashram. That means it's a place where we cultivate spiritual activities. Mm -hmm. So maintaining and serving family members is part of Grihasta Ashram. Do it as a service to the Lord. Offer whatever you do as a service to the Lord and live by religious principles. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada said, if you follow this, you will not forget Krishna in any circumstances. Whatever you do, do it for Krishna. Whatever you eat, eat only Krishna Prashadam. Whatever you offer or you give away to others, do it as an offering to Krishna. Whatever austerities you accept also should be aimed at the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that's a science. It's an art. One has to learn to do that in other words, one has to mold, as Prabhupada said, one has to mold his life in such a way that they don't forget Krishna. And so connect everything you do with Krishna. That's all. Mm -hmm. My family members are 
are parts and parts of Krishna. I'm serving my family members and therefore I'm offering whatever I do to them as an offering to Krishna. Okay, so let me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, sorry. But um, if I think that like, uh, as we work at workplace and then we, we think that we are working at workplace and we are serving that particular organization or institution, uh, is it something similar to that, that we, we think that Grisasram is the institution of Krishna and then so family or everyone uh, as, as for the service to Krishna? If we think that way, is it? Yeah, we have something to there, there, are, there are principles we have to follow. Yeah. Um, this is called, this is called, um, let's see, what is it? Uh, following in the footsteps of the previous acharyas. That means what activities one performs in the sannyas and brahmacharya ashram is different than the activities performed in the grihastha ashram. But both are spiritual because they're directed towards uh, spiritual goals, more Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. So you have to know what activities to perform and you have to know, you have to follow the rules and regulations. Yep. Get you off the bodily platform. Therefore, mm -hmm. there are rules and regulations. So mm -hmm. if you if you know what the rules and regulations are, you stay within the boundaries of proper activity. If you go outside of these rules and regulations, just like the Grihastas can accumulate some material things, but generally for the for the sannyasis and griha and brahmacharis, that is against the ashram. Mm. In other words, separate from their need and devotional service. Mm. So know what your what the rules and regulations are for each ashram. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So okay. just like just like mm. uh, one of the principles is you have to eat. Well, eat only prasadam. Hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have to, if you have to have children, follow the process as given by the Pancharetri Giviti for production of Krishna conscious children. Yeah. Not like the cats and dogs, they just are the human beings. They just engage in all kinds of sensual activities and produce children just like animals with no real, but devotees follow mm -hmm. the principles of Garbhadhan Samskara mm -hmm. in order to bring about a uh, proper family. Mm -hmm. So there's rules and regulations that must be followed accordingly for eating, for procreation, for, uh, for uh, performing activities, Mm -hmm. the, the Grihastas must uh, worship the Lord in its deity form, keeping the deity and mm -hmm. engaging in devotional service like that. So um, all of these are mentioned in the Shastras and particularly in the Nectar of Devotion and Srimad Bhagavatam, we can find all the principles that govern Grihasta Ashram in these. And there are books specifically meant that focus on these ashrams in order to make it easy for us to have a clear understanding of what we should do and what we should vo avoid because the whole process of devotional service is not only about doing things, it's about avoiding other things. There are two sides, Nishedas and Vidyas, Anukulena Krishna, Anukulena and Pratikul. Anukalena means things that we should perform and, and pratikul means things we must avoid. So unless we know that, we will get trapped. Therefore, Rupa Goswami teaches us the science of bhakti through his writings in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, uh, Upadesh Amrita, and also through the process of Srimad Bhagavatam given to us by Srila Prabhupada through Veda Vyas. 
So we have to know these things. Otherwise, we will not see any difference between ordinary material activities and spiritual activities. Okay. Thank you so much, Gunmaraj. That makes so much sense now because uh, we can take this institution same way as a working institution, follow the, see, we, at work also, we have to follow all these rules and regulations, we yeah. and our limits, everything we have to follow. So same way if we do this one. So it is, it is like uh, offering service to Krishna and we will be on the spiritual platform that way, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can, with body, mind, and words, mm -hmm. and resources, you mm -hmm. can serve the Lord. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, I, I, I just want to ask a general question in a way because um, yes it is personally related to me as well um, I'm following not the complete I'm not chanting 16 rounds but at one stage we when we go to um, if we want to carry on with Krishna consciousness and we have any any um, want to do any advancement we need to get initiated first isn't isn't it you make so, advancement up to a point where initiation becomes the next step krishna is leading you along until you get until you get to that stage where in order to make further advancement initiation must be next so until in other words you we're making advancement preparing ourselves to come to the point of accepting the bona fide spiritual master. Once we get to that stage, then if we don't accept that stage, then our advancement doesn't go any farther. We stay on that level until we actually take that step. Okay, so uh, with me personally, I mean, um, if I got to that stage when I was following the four principles and chanting, I'm not very intelligent, so I sometimes don't remember everything. Um, which I mean, I was thinking when you know, who, which guru would actually accept me because I feel I would be completely useless in any service apart from staying at home and maybe offering prasadam to Krishna and doing my rounds. So who in the who would accept me as a as their disciple? Well, the point is that uh, all living entities must come to that platform of accepting bona fide guru. And there's one, there's one verse that says, in every life, everyone gets a mother and a father. But it's very rare to get a spiritual master. So that opportunity is available in human life. When we want to make a solution to all the problems of life. In other words, we, we, say, we, we ask this question, why do I have to suffer? Why do I have to die? How can I find happiness? These are the questions that bring us to the platform of being uh, qualified to accept a bona fide spiritual master. When we're seriously looking for the solutions of life, Krishna, Mrs. Krishna directly sends us the spiritual master. And then we have to recognize that and then move forward. And the first stage is called aspiring. It's not that initiation is not the first stage in relationship to the spiritual master. One has to qualify themselves in that relationship and that usually takes about a year, at least a minimum amount of year. And Prabhupada calls that mutual, mutual, um, uh, what's the word he uses? Mutual uh, uh, observation. 
the guru observe, observes the, the disciple to see if they're testing, mutual testing. The, the guru observes the disciple to see if they are qualified. And the disciple is observing the spiritual master and seeing if this, if this is the person I want to surrender my life to. So that is the preliminary part. And that doesn't obligate one to stay in that relationship. One may leave that relationship and go to another spiritual master for whatever reason. There have been times where spiritual masters have refused certain aspiring disciples. And the many times the aspiring disciples have changed spiritual masters in that aspiring stage. But once you come to the stage of accepting initiation, then that becomes your eternal connection with Krishna through that person, the spiritual master. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. But what is the qualification? One has to be looking. One has to be searching. There are people who practice spiritual life but don't see the need for or the importance of having a spiritual master. Therefore, they make advancement only up to a certain point because Rupa Goswami mentions Adal Strata Sadhu Sangha Bhajana Kriya Anartha Nivritti Nishta Ruchi Ashakti Bhava and Prema. He mentions nine stages, steps from the very beginning to the to uh, complete Krishna consciousness. And the third stage is called Bhajana Kriya, which means accepting the shelter of a bona fide spiritual master. That's the third of the nine stages. So we developed that desire in the second stage. And what is that? Sadhu Sangha, in association with the gopis. In association with devotees, we get a taste for the process and we then desire a spiritual master. If we don't associate with devotees, then we'll find it very hard to move to that next stage. We might theoretically understand it's necessary, but within our heart, we haven't made that, you know, we haven't made that transformation. So therefore, Sadhu Sangha is very important. Mm -hmm. Association with devotees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Never get discouraged. Krishna is always trying to help you. Thank you. Lavanya Mataji, Shidavi Mataji, you have raised your hand, please. Yeah, Guru Maharaj, hey Krishna, please accept our humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for, for today's class and stressing the importance of Guru and stressing the importance of understanding that the path to happiness lies in reconnection with Krishna. Uh, my question is about the fruitive workers of this world. They are completely steeped and immersed in uh, fruitive gain and activities leading to fruitive gain, uh, complacent, self-assured, uh, arrogant even. They are just completely involved and they think that the be all and end all of life is just the next material gain. Well, as devotees, we feel so much compassion for people caught up like this. But how to get them out of that hypnotized state they are in? That is called preaching. <laughs> and there are many methods by which you can administer the medicine. So one has to adopt, you know, the method according to the nature of the disease. We have general methods, but then application of the method, just like you may have you may have a doctor and you may also have the medicine 
and the, the right medicine. But if it's not applied uh, pharmaceutically, to use a word, in other words, if it's not applied in the right way, although the medicine and the doctor are there, the application is not right, then the medicine won't have its effect. So we have to learn how to apply the medicine. The medicine has been given to us in the form of our own spiritual practice. Mm. So that means you have to learn the process of, you know, awakening people, but you have to see, therefore it says, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't pour ghee on the ashes. Mm or ghee on something that will ignite. In other words, if people are reluctant to accept what you're giving, don't waste your time. Go to people who are more open and more receptive. Mm. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for your mercy. Mm -hmm. You'll get your chance when you come to Slovenia. <laughs> You'll find a lot of preaching here. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. You're giving me life by bringing me there. Thank you so much. Somebody had to do it. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> Somebody had to. Lavanya and Srinivas Prabhu gave me a little taste. They brought this dead person back to life by taking me for Mangalarti. I felt yeah, you... I was coming back alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, the temperature is going down, so don't worry. It'll get to normal soon. <laughs> for being the expert physician i i'm just i'm just giving you the medicine <laughs> you, that's all. with a terrible patient you have been so patient thank you so much <laughs> it's like that <laughs> You know, you know what, what child likes to get the medicine given by the parent? <laughs> but we made it sweet. It's called hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. In association of others who are doing the same. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for your mercy. <laughs> Don't underestimate this process. It's very simple, but it's very, very direct in awakening the soul to Krishna. Mm. It may look quite simple, but it is actually very, very authorized to connect the soul with Krishna through the activities, mm. although very simple activities. Yes, Guru Maharaj. That's the thing, you know. It as Prabhupada said, it's simple for the simple and complicated for the crooked. So, there's yeah. Of... But then again, Rupa Goswami says, Utsaham Nishtaya Daryat. Enthusiasm, determination, and patience mm -hmm. are the ingredients you apply along with the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Enthusiasm keeps you going. Determination lets you continue to go when there are difficulties and obstacles. And impatience allows you to wait for the mercy of the Lord to manifest through the activities that you perform. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare so, Krishna. So we don't have any questions, Guru Maharaj, now on the chat. Oh, Namita Mataji is there. Namita Mataji, over to you, please. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. My humble obeisances to you, Maharaj. And my humble obeisances to all the Vaishnav devotees there. So Maharaj, I wanted to ask this question that if you have family members who are not very receptive to Krishna consciousness, should you just leave them alone or should you still try and continue to preach them? 
Well, you have to determine that by uh, how receptive they are. You know, if they're not receptive of all, then uh, we see that your own transformation in Krishna consciousness is the best form in order to, you know, allow, allow them uh, some understanding of the process. As you make advancement, you also benefit them and they also notice how you are developing these saintly and spiritual qualities. So we also uh, help others by becoming Krishna conscious ourselves. That's another form of preaching and it's also very powerful. As they say, example is higher than precept. So our example speaks louder than our words. Words are important, but unless we are up to the standard in our own practice, our words don't have much effect. So, but even if we don't use words, still, as it says, the sun, when it appears, all it has to do is appear and automatically it gives light and heat and happiness. So same way, when a devotee appears, that it, that it's not so much about what they say, it's just by their presence, they change the atmosphere. So you, with family members, that is also the method, become Krishna consciousness more and more. And if you find the opportunity and it looks like you can do something, then you try. But if, but if they see you're trying to force them against their will, they may also develop a certain block and that allows them not to see the benefit of Krishna consciousness. So don't force them, but encourage them in a positive way. So that takes some, some understanding of the situation. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever works, that's basically what, it, what goes to see what will work. If nothing works, ultimately, then your own example is the best form of transforming them. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Asutosh, you have a question? Yeah, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. My humble obeisances to you. So just a follow-up question, Maharaj. You said gently encourage them. So what could be examples of gently, gentle encouragement? Yeah, Prashadam. <laughs> Prashadam. Okay, that's and one, it... and a, a type of a, a type of kindness that comes by way of Vaishnav culture. Just being kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kindness is another way to to bring about transformation. Could could praying to Krishna be a be a, be be an option? Maharaj, because it's about my dad. He's not receptive and he's uh, he lives in India. I live in the UK. So, Well, that, that geographical barrier makes it hard because he's influenced by the environment around him, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which reinforces whatever he is. Well, that's, that's something you have to consider. If he was personally present, it would be a lot more chances that you could reach him, but being in that distance. So whenever you go there, then, then you use your opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's nice we want to help family members, but as it says that, again, as I mentioned to your wife, as you make advancement, they also benefit automatically. Mm -hmm. Imper imperceptibly they're not even perceiving it but they're actually becoming more inclined to spirituality through the power of a family member and if, and if you become a pure devotee when they die they take birth 
in a spiritual family in their next life. Mm -hmm. They get the benefit of your bhakti by getting an opportunity for devotional service in their next life. Mm -hmm. Okay, my love. <laughs> Family members are the hardest ones to preach to. <laughs> mm. Thank you, my Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Namita Mataji, you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, Hare Krishna. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. I, my follow up question is from uh, Smita Mataji's discussion. Uh, you said that uh, when do you need a guru? I mean, when do you need an initiation? That is, uh, uh, when you perform your sadhana and you are maybe somewhere you are stopping at that point you need a guru am i correct Maharaj? well it's automatic it's not it's, if you don't take the next step then you don't progress any further you're progressing and until you reach the next step and if you if you don't fail to take the next step then you stay where you are and if you stay where you are long enough you may also go backwards so yeah, you have to take that next step. And how do we understand that, Maharaj, ourselves? By uh, just yeah. by analyzing or maybe uh, discussing with the fellow devotees or? Yeah, yeah. By, by performing the activities of devotional service in the association of other devotees. As, as the scriptures say, when the disciple is ready, the guru appears. <laughs> Ah. Yeah, Krishna will send you the guru when you when you are ready, and then you have to recognize that. Okay. Okay, that answers. Thank you, thank you, Maharaj. And then the statement is: We want Krishna, so we try to get Krishna, and Krishna. Uh, going to Krishna means Krishna is giving us himself in the form of guru. Okay. Uh, that just uh, that just reminds me of one thing. I was just reading the uh, nectar of uh, I think uh, it, it is by Satswarup uh, Das Goswami. The, I, I'm reading the recent book, um, The Anecdotes of uh, uh, Asi Bhakti Vedanta Swami. It's Prabhupada Nectar. Okay, and, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, and I recently just a relating incident I came across uh, in which... Uh, 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 I think uh, it is mentioned the experience of uh, Hari, Harikesh Swami. Yeah, he mentions uh, that um, he was uh, uh, he he was in university and he said that uh, uh, Prabhupada was right near me or maybe you know right near the lobby which I was passing through. I would have uh, come across him many times, but he was asking Prabhupada that, uh, why didn't I approach you? Uh, he was just pouring his heart out in the in those uh, letter or in those uh, uh, talk with Prabhupada. Uh, he said like when Prabhupada came to their university and many times passed near him, but somehow he didn't notice his presence. He was lamenting why such a situation was there. Although, um, like, I am not at the level of Harikesh Swami, but I can still uh, 
uh, you know relate because uh, even i came across uh, iskon when i was in college days but somehow i couldn't continue that but uh, that uh, that was just reminding me and he uh, and he uh, questions that to prabhupad and prabhupad says that uh, maybe you were not ready at that yeah. time yeah that's true yeah so uh problem prabhupad is asked why did you come at the time you came prabhupad says we i came at the time when you were ready to to accept what i had to give so the social and political environment that prabhupad appeared in was conducive to the population accepting you know shila prabhupad because it was a time when people were looking for a better way of life that was the hippie era in america in 1966 the 60s and the and in the 70s it was a time of rejecting the old ways and looking for alternative ways to live and understand how to live life and probably came right at that time therefore he swept so many people up because they were ready for something different something new not everybody stayed but those who were were who were serious about making a solution to the problems of life started to understand that what prabhupad was giving was what they were really looking for but prabhupad might have come at a different time he might not have had the same uh you know success and prabhupad also said that so krishna sent him at the time when he was most uh needed <laughs> yes maharaj so yeah it finally comes to it like, keep patience and keep your trust uh, on krishna that on time he'll give you everything yeah but don't wait forever <laughs> <laughs> you're right maharaj patience but executing the process continue to hear and chant the glories of the lord in the association of devotees and adopt a mood of service also we should also we should also be thinking how to serve krishna how to serve the mission krishna's mission right maharaj hare krishna hare krishna Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj so Guru Maharaj we are 26 minutes on time so i don't mm -hmm. see any questions now no hands raised okay then if there's no more questions then we'll conclude here Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu you have anything i see your name there <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj <laughs> i have some questions but i do want to take over um, So, um, um, I mean, do you have time, or or, is it, or I can ask you on Saturday at the retreat. It's up to you. <laughs> well, if you ask me, then I'm the only one will benefit. But if you ask now, so many people will benefit. <laughs> Thank you, Mons. Okay, so um, I, okay, I'll just start with this one. So, um, in terms of in terms of devotee association first of all how do we how do we understand and associate properly with peers how do we first of all how do we understand that someone is a peer because it seems to me and you feel free to correct me that people can a bit can be in krishna consciousness or have come to the process at the same time so they've roughly been around for the same number of years but there's differences in terms of maybe their seriousness or other factors so how do we in a deeper sense understand peers that was one question and the other question i wanted to ask is how do we deal with envy that was the other question in terms of from others so i guess whichever one you'd like to start with if that's okay how to deal with envy you mean how to get rid of it 
No, when when other people are acting that way, out of envy. Oh, out of envy is towards you. We really can't change other people, but we can act in such a way as somehow or other not accept what they're giving us mm -hmm. or actually distance ourselves from that. One of the ways to get away from that, to avoid negativity is to get away from the, mm -hmm. that, that energy. If it's not possible, then um, by our own example in Krishna consciousness, we may also change another person. Mm -hmm. It depends on the situation, mm -hmm. how much they actually want to change or how much, what is the nature of that envy? Mm -hmm. I was just reading something that I, I gave a class in envy a while back and now it's, it's a transcription that was given to me and I'm, I was just going through it today. And some of the things that I remember reading was that uh, distancing yourself from those who are envious and that helps them also because it doesn't allow them to exhibit their envy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if there's no object for whatever they're trying to give, then, then they can't give it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, sometimes it says, sometimes you can also approach the person in a very direct way and say, is there some way I can serve you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sometimes that's very disarming for the person they become a little bit uh, uh, confused on how to respond to that but if they're a little intelligent they may also respond by saying well you know uh, you know I, I'm just feeling like this towards you but maybe maybe I'm not right <laughs> so but if you fight the same way that they're directing, you know, it just, the, the tension just increases and it doesn't change much. Okay, that's really, I suppose that's really useful, Marge. Just to, just to ask a little bit more on this. So if it's something where the person is doing it very, very covertly in the hidden way, and if they're doing it to kind of undermine what you're trying to share, so in that sense, so they're, they're, they're not really into having an open conversation because it's, it's all being done behind the scenes and then and they won't be willing to to be honest about it maybe because they feel a bit insecure for some reason. Yeah, well, their insecurity is really their envy turns towards themselves. Mm -hmm. and that's called jealousy. Mm -hmm. Jealousy and envy is basically the same, but jealousy is more directed towards oneself and envy is, out, is going outward. So that they feel insecure or inferior in a material way towards someone or something, some activity or some person. Yeah. And then and there that it takes the form of being unhappy or even planning. Uh, they get also fun, they also become depressed or planning to somehow lash out and exhibit that bad, that negative feeling by making the other person feel bad. <laughs> But yeah, it may be a little hard to do that. Generally, I'm, I would just distance myself from that. Mm -hmm. And then they say, you know, absence makes, makes the heart grow fun. Not well, absence doesn't allow for, for the things to manifest itself. Mm -hmm. It can't, nothing can happen when there's no, that, that association is not there. In, in a situation where you're not present, but they're actually trying to undermine you to other people, is there, any, is there anything that needs to be done there or not? Or is it just better to distance yourself and then just leave it to that? Well, if you want to follow the, the example of Srivast Thakur, when that uh, Brahmin tried to defame him by putting all the paraphernalia for worshipping Durga on his doorstep, and just to show the, the people in the area that he's a Durga worshiper mm. and not a Vaishnava. I mean, when he came out, he just didn't try to hide it. He said, now you know what I'm really like. <laughs> or sometimes you can be a little, not facetious, but a little bit, uh, you say, well, you know, you're saying certain bad qualities about me, but if you really want to know more, I have so many more bad qualities I can tell you about. 
yes, 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 yes. So you know, we're not, we don't have we don't have to worry about defending ourselves in these situations. Mm -hmm. The only time we defend ourselves, if we're defending ourselves in terms of the religious principles that are being violated, we descend, we defend religious principles, but we don't defend ourselves, because we did, we know that Krishna is there to defend us, mm -hmm. take shelter of Krishna. No one can can hurt you when you are under the shelter of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. <laughs> we used to say that when we were kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you much. And then the other question was was about peers. So, as, as like, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm hoping to understand this in, in a deep way, because as we said, sometimes people can be around a similar age or they could have been in, come to Krishna consciousness at the same time but there may be still differences. So in a deeper sense, how do we determine, okay, this is a, this is a peer. And especially, I, I know you've talked about the principle of Swajati before. How do we understand this idea of Swajati in relation to, um, to this as well, please? Well, I think by observing, mm -hmm. by observing each other, we get an understanding on the, on the level of practice that people are at. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the enthusiasm that comes by way of the activity is an indication of one's advancement in spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Not so much the performance of the activity, but one who is fixed mm -hmm. in the activity and is enthusiastic and remains, remains fixed despite whatever obstacles may come. Mm -hmm. So only through association can we learn that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just like we may, we may all be god brothers of the and god sisters of the same guru, but there may be different levels like that. But the principle of friendliness amongst disciples or devotees who are serving together is is the element of association. So we associate by becoming friendly and by being supportive of each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even if we don't have the particular clear understanding of the different levels. But if someone is preaching, then we can say that person is, is in a higher position if they're a preacher. Because it says that, you know, those who are spreading the glories of the Lord are considered to be on the topmost platform of execution of devotional service. Mm -hmm. So we respect and honor and even assist the preachers in their devotional activity, in their preaching activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, peer association seems to be percentage-wise that association that is the most. One senior devotee made, a, made a, a percentage calculation, which seems to be accepted within our society. He said, we should associate with we should associate 20% with people who are more advanced, 20% with people who are less, and 60% with peers. Mm -hmm. So peer association appears to be the more, you know, more frequent, more, more, more time like that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there are activities in the association with the different categories. So for those who are more advanced, we serve them and we hear from them. Those who are the same, we, if we make friends and share Krishna consciousness together. And those who are lesser, we try to raise them up by giving them Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. so these are the three ways you associate with the three categories. Yeah. Thank you much. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kalakanti Radhiki, you can thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, like that. 
Well, we since we tend to gravitate towards people who are like-minded. Actually, one more question, Mark. Just because when we were at the um, at the Bhakti um tribute, the one year disappearance. You mentioned Radhanath Maharaj and you mentioned how his mind is very fixed. And I was just going to ask also, are there any instructions or guidance how one can fix the mind more in Krishna consciousness? So, somebody asked me that. I think through, through attentive chanting, mm -hmm. it develops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through attentive chanting, attentive reading, mm -hmm. attentive hearing. Mm -hmm. When we, when we learn to focus more on the essential principles of devotional service, such as hearing, chanting, and, and reading, the mind becomes more fixed mm -hmm. because these are the most powerful forms of devotional service and they pull you into that energy. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes devotees say, well, I want to go deeper into Krishna consciousness. Well, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. Focus. Mm -hmm. And also focus on something you want to develop. Mm -hmm. In other words, you might, you might take up a study of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. So you'll spend a good part of your day every day studying and learning Bhagavatam. That will help you go deeper and also give you a greater amount of knowledge. Mm -hmm. You can do the same thing with the holy name also. Radhas Maharaj also used to say, whatever you want to be, whatever you want to achieve in devotional service, he said, you have to focus on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you make that, make that, uh, therefore, short-term goals are also part of achieving a long-term goal. Mm -hmm. They lead to the long-term goal. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. Very well. well. Thank you. Very good. Show. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Marge, also, um, who's, your, who's your servant while you're here in terms of if there will be possible to have, have a darshan or maybe at some other point while you're, while you're in the UK? Uh, I don't have any servants, but I have somebody who assists me. <laughs> His name is Roberto. Roberto, okay. I think... I'm in contact. Maybe I can, I'll, I'll message him and try and work out the time that works for you. Or maybe we can speak about it on Saturday and then work out the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just received a invitation to a program that you're going to be at on the 15th of August. Oh, I think it's, is that the retreat? No, it's... Uh, it's Rad Rad Radhika Ranjan is... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, wonderful. That's really good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's I wonderful. didn't want to accept it because I was thinking I might leave before then, but then when I saw your name there, I said, all right. <laughs> okay, that's really, that's really good news. We can hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hmm. Okay. Vrindavan Nath, are you still with us? I think, um, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, I think uh, Vrindavan Nath Prabhu um, is uh, off the computer. He has uh, to attend something else. So um, I guess I'll end the call now uh, if there are no more questions. Uh, I think we can end here. It's, yeah. We're already almost two hours into the class. Yes, okay, thank you very much and we'll uh, 
Meet you all tomorrow again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Bhagavad Gita. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.